My wife, Audrey, has been fantastic to me. Tall, 180 centimeters. Tall and thin with dark blonde hair. I prefer tall, thin women. And she had exquisite breasts in the first size. The waist is thin, the hips are slender, and the buttocks are huge enough to crack walnuts. When we first met and she gazed at me, her eyes shone like a child. On Christmas morning, I saw all of the presents under the Christmas tree for the first time. My height is 188 centimeters. I was on the swim team at school, so I had a swimmer's physique. All of our buddies are always joking. They knew how we felt about each other since we smiled so much and had sex. That was wonderful. For the first two years, we met for sex. Any subsequent communication was simply accidental. It was great. Then Audrey made a mistake. Her insect was named Brad. The basketball team sent her forward. Brad is 210 centimeters tall. Everyone I knew messaged me that night, either to tell me to look at Instagram images or to send me party photos. Audrey was obsessed with this person, and images of Brad and Audrey kissing surfaced later on. Finally, a party-goer emailed me a video showing Bradley taking her hand and leading her into his room with a big smile. I was infuriated. The next day at noon, I went to her apartment, and she was still asleep in her room when she awoke. I gave her the images and she explained what happened. At least she was truthful. She traveled there with friends. She reconnected with Brad, whom she had previously known briefly, and they began spending time together. It got dark, and she didn't realize how much she drank. Brad welcomed her into his room and showed her his achievements. The next thing she knew, they were kissing. She claimed she doesn't remember their having sex. She said she was inebriated and made a terrible mistake. She simply loved me and was deeply remorseful for her error, promising that it would not happen again. She stated she was willing to do whatever I desired. If only I could forgive her. She stated that she loved me and wanted to spend the rest of her life with me. All of her friends and the majority of my friends told me that it was a one-time mistake on her part and that I should have accepted her back. Most of my friends who stated this also said she was the most beautiful female I could ever have and that I would never find another like her. I was upset at her for about two weeks before forgiving her and taking advantage of the all-inclusive offer. She kept telling me how sorry she was, and by the time I forgiven her, I was already going insane. But I warned Audrey that if it happened again, we were done, that she was fortunate to have this one chance. Looking back many years, practically all of those guys who begged me to forgive her because she was so attractive are in bad relationships because they chose women for all the wrong reasons— Every individual who told me to leave her is now happily married. None of them got divorced. There appears to be something about valuing integrity over sexuality. I had no idea at the time, save for that one mistake. Audrey appeared to be the ideal person. I obtained a job as a coder. Audrey accepted a position as an administrator in a huge company. She had a 45-minute commute each way to work. I worked from home the most of the time. We married at the end of the year and welcomed our first kid, Matt. The following year, the following year, our daughter Marcy was born. Life was good. My career was taking off. Audrey decided that she wanted to make more money and began marketing real estate using her natural height and beauty. She began specializing in more luxurious residences. Audrey's income has also increased. Then Audrey's work hours increased, including weekend employment, and our sex life dwindled. To say that I believe in tests is an understatement. I have not forgotten what happened. Within a week, I had put surveillance software on her phone and a sound recorder in her purse. Two days later, I received tapes of her having sex with a man named David. According to the GPS on her phone, they were in his apartment, which was on the opposite side of the city from her office. My heart was torn, like a drowning man grasping for something to hold on to. I clung to the fact that they never discussed or bonded over anything affectionate. There is none. I love you. There is none. You're the best. There is. No, I missed it. I felt like there was still anything I could do to get her back, for my own and the children's sake. When she returned home, I made her favorite food. The children were dressed very adorable. I gave her a lot of attention. She seems to relish the attention. I told her how much I loved her and how important it was for us to spend more time together as a family. She agreed. I was pleased. I had a chance. I was on my way to winning. I began emailing her photos of the children whenever I could. When I spotted her messaging David, I texted her. 
I love and miss you. I was overjoyed when she told David that she couldn't make it to his apartment on Wednesday. On Friday night, I requested my brother and his wife to watch the children. I brought Audrey to a five-star restaurant where we ate and danced. That night, we were attempting to shatter our record for most sex in one evening. We couldn't, but it was enjoyable to try. The following day, we picked up the kids and went to the water park together. We spent the entire day having fun in the sun, playing with the kids and spending time together. Life was good and I believed it would work. Audrey's text to David on Wednesday morning totally destroyed my heart. I look forward to seeing you. I missed you. My wife lied. Everything I believed about her was false. I was not going to listen to her justifications. I wasn't going to let her deceitful lips tell me which aspects of our lives were true. I wasn't going to listen to her when she said she was broken and needed my help to mend it. Audrey had abandoned me and the children as far as I knew. She simply hasn't given up her dating privileges yet. I saw David. I activated the camera on her phone using the monitoring program. She then took out her phone to switch off the sound. For a brief period, I could see David's face. I recognized him as Audrey's colleague. I met him while visiting her office one day. The first impression was that he was a complete fool. Now there was no doubt. After deciding not to go to jail for assault, I determined that the best course of action would be to remove Audrey from the lives of the children and myself. She lied to the kids and to me every day, the people she claimed to love the most in her life. I would exploit every flaw in her double life. I would try to get as many assets out of the marriage as feasible. As the primary parent, I would seek primary custody of the children. I would also show the children and our family how Audrey chooses her partner over us, so that they are not attracted into her deceptive lies. And I intended to make the vengeance as permanent and unpleasant as possible. The Marx Group performed a concert the next week. I stated this to Audrey when I noticed she wasn't paying attention, which had become regular. But Marcy was the day before her talk. I utilized Audrey's phone's monitoring program to schedule a reminder for the day after the event. When I arrived at school, I checked Audrey's phone to ensure she was at her lover's apartment and then utilized monitoring software to ensure her phone was set to silent mode. I left a message on her phone and followed up an hour later to see where she was. I left a message to remind her that she would be late. She called me in a panic at the conclusion of the band's gig, asking if Marcy had played yet. I asked her where she was, but she just ignored me and inquired about Marcy again. I lied telling her that she only missed her and that we'd see her at home. Marcy was upset on the way home because her mother wasn't present. I explained that sometimes adults are too busy helping everyone in the family and find it difficult to depart. Marcy and Matt appeared to accept the answer, but they were both downcast on the walk home. Audrey's tardiness and appearance at the end of family gatherings were becoming the norm. When we arrived home, Audrey was still dressed for work. For some reason, she smelled like she had recently had a shower. She tried to make amends to Marcy with much love. Marcy played the poor victim card, which youngsters are good at. A few hours later. Marcy finally held Audrey passionately and informed her mother that she could not miss the next concert. I wondered if Audrey actually felt regret for missing her daughter's concert or if she was simply frightened of being caught cheating. Then I observed Audrey and her lover meeting alone at the same modest cafe on the outskirts of town. The eatery was well known for its scotch eggs. I somehow got into a conversation about scotch eggs with my father-in-law, who noted that he hadn't eaten a good scotch egg in years. I mentioned a restaurant. I arranged a reservation for Wednesday when they went to the restaurant. Most of the time, I picked up my family and drove them to a restaurant while glancing at my phone. I noticed Audrey was still in the office. I took a scenic path. Audrey's phone began to glide towards the restaurant halfway there. We finally arrived a few minutes after Audrey. As I followed my father-in-law and mother-in-law into the restaurant, I noticed Audrey at a table in the back, next to Jerk. I asked rather loudly, Do you want to sit in a booth or at a table in the corner of my eye? Audrey's head shot up. Her eyes opened and she jerked away from the table as if she had been shot from a cannon. The moron had a bewildered expression on his face until he noticed us at the entrance. As we sat down, he attempted to shrink himself. Audrey sprang up and approached us. Mom and Dad, what are you doing here? Dad smiled. I'm glad to see Audrey. We heard about their wonderful scotch eggs and wanted to try them. My father-in-law leaned over to hug Audrey. Audrey, 
They're fantastic. Why not join us? My coworker and I are seated right there. She pointed to a booth in the restaurant's back corner where Jerk was waving. His face and neck were crimson. The grin on the parents' faces vanished. The father-in-law made two steps back towards his mother-in-law before taking her hand. The mother-in-law glared at the moron with a missing smile and said in a monotone voice, We don't want to disrupt your business lunch. Audrey was extremely eager. Not an issue. We're simply getting a quick bite before going out to show the property. Let's just say it was a bustling lunch. Everyone shook hands after the jerk. Audrey did the majority of the talking. My mother-in-law frowned during the meal. Father-in-law's smile faded as soon as he spotted the jerk, and he gazed at him the entire supper without saying anything. Not one word. I asked basic questions such as, How long have you worked here, and how come a wonderful guy like you is still single? My favorite. Audrey has a sibling who is also single. Audrey, you should introduce them. If everything works out, we might be connected. Audrey's smile was clearly tight. The idiot when the stillness had lasted too long. After my response, I said, No thanks. I've got a girlfriend, I asked. Is it truly someone we know or is it a secret? So you don't want to talk? Jerk. She's in a poor relationship and wants to get out of it. I am not comfortable telling you who it is. He stated this with a wide grin, his gaze fixed just on me. I said he was an asshole. The smirk vanished when he noticed that everyone at the table was staring at him intently, especially Audrey. The food arrived. The father-in-law and mother-in-law, who generally eat slowly, finished their meals swiftly. I simply took a few nibbles of my scotch egg. Audrey noticed and inquired if the scotch egg was tasty. I stated that I had lost my appetite and glanced at her. Audrey's mother nodded at the waiter and handed him a dollar one hundred bill to pay for everyone. Everyone praised her, and she sprang up, stating she needed to use the restroom. The waiter returned, and Audrey's father accepted the change and gazed at the jerk, as if he were something disgusting. He had accidentally trodden on it and went directly to the restroom without saying anything. I spoke to Audrey and the jerk. Sorry for interrupting your business lunch. I am sure you have ideas to discuss and people to deceive. That is correct. I stood up and started leaving the restaurant. Audrey chased me to my car. Audrey, it was good to meet you at lunchtime. We will address this at home. Your folks will be here in a moment. By this point, I'd seen Audrey's mother and father emerge from the toilet hallway, virtually sprinting straight for the front door, not looking in the direction of the jerk. Audrey, seeing where I was staring, she lowered her attention to the ground and spoke. It's probably best this way. My parents emerged, hugged Audrey briefly without saying anything, and got into my car. I walked away from Audrey without saying anything. Neither of us said anything the entire way home. When I dropped off my in-laws, I went out to say farewell as usual. Mom grabbed me firmly and said she loved me like the son she never had. Dad hugged me sideways and instructed me to bring the kids. He missed all of us. This was the first time he offered me more than a handshake. Dad had to help Mom climb the stairs. They appeared a lot older than when I picked them up. I was saddened to learn that Audrey was worth lying to her parents, straight into their faces. They have already rejected her in-law's other daughter, Audrey's younger sister, Karen. She was married twice, both of which ended in divorce due to infidelity. Both times, she lied to her parents about the cause for her divorce. Karen lied to her parents, claiming that her second husband, who was actually a great person, was abusive and cheating on her. It ended when a friend brought the in-laws a video of Karen kissing a married guy in a restaurant booth similar to the one Audrey and her lover occupied. Audrey's parents knew the married man's parents since they all wore diapers. Audrey's mother and the married man's mother were great friends throughout their lives. They were closer than sisters. A married man divorced, leaving a wife and three children. He ended up relocating across the nation. The father-in-law's pals departed the church. They had been members their entire lives to avoid their in-laws. The in-laws' buddy never communicated with them again. Despite living in the same city, Karen's parents have not spoken to her since. Audrey mentioned Karen several times, but her parents quickly interrupted her and cautioned her not to utter her name again. Karen attempted to sneak into her son-in-law's church during a Sunday service. When Karen's father saw she was present, he stood up and interrupted the pastor in the middle of his sermon apologizing for having to leave right away. They both walked out the door nearest to Karen, hardly even recognizing her presence. 
Everyone else noticed Karen's presence, gazing at her with disdain as her parents walked away. Audrey arrived home that evening with a fantastic narrative about how a dinner meeting with her lover resulted in a significant transaction for both of them. Audrey, it is unacceptable to dine alone with an unmarried man. I don't want you near him anymore, and I don't want you to go out to dinner with him ever again, even in a group. Honey, I apologize for that. If that worries you, I won't go to lunch with him again. Do not worry about him. We made a fantastic bargain. I informed Audrey that I would sleep in the guest room until she had properly apologized to me and her parents. I mentioned your parents were upset. Remember when your sister was found cheating? Audrey was plainly startled when I mentioned her sister, but she assured me I was exaggerating. On the good side, I now had a reason not to have sex with her. I next installed a switch in my wife's automobile, followed by her lover's car. I planted it in the asshole's car while he was having sex with my wife at his apartment. I also failed the transmission sensor. This will cause the check engine light to illuminate and keep mechanics guessing. We had a parent-led divide and conquer day. Matt had to go to a football game, while Marcy had to attend a band competition. Audrey planned to spend the afternoon with her sweetheart. That's what I heard live on her phone when I was watching Matt play football. I switched Audrey's machine off. Knock, knock, knock. What has occurred, dear, came back so quickly. My automobile will not start. Let's see what happens in 15 minutes. I'm not sure what's wrong. The battery is charged. The headlights function. It simply won't start. Would you like me to offer you a ride home? No, you idiot. If my husband sees you dropping me off at the house after the dinner incident, he will be furious. Call for a tow truck. I need to pick Mary up and take her to the banjo competition across town. Why not allow her husband to drive her? He's with Matt at the football game. We had already planned for me to take Marcy. You're welcome to take my automobile again. A restaurant is in disarray. Yes, okay. Take me to the rental car and I'll phone a tow company to come pick up my vehicle. Make sure to greet the tow truck driver when he arrives and pay him $1.50 to provide the address of our business where the car was recovered. Audrey's telephone rang. Damn. Hello, dear me. Have you picked Marcy up yet? I'm having issues with my automobile. I believe it's the battery. Would you like me to come to your office and help you start your car? No, I mean it's okay. I've already phoned a tow truck and will rent a car nearby so Marcy isn't late. Okay, call if you need assistance. I hung up. Come on now. You're taking me to the Avis rental location near our workplace. But budget is only a stone's throw away. Damn, I can't get a rental car bill from somewhere that has nothing to do with my job and is right close to your residence. Yes, justice. However, Audrey arrived late to take up Marcy. Fortunately, Marcy called me in a panic, so I asked one of the other dads I was friends with to drive Matt home. Following his agreement, I was able to pick up Marcy for the competition in a short period of time. When Marcy and I arrived home, Matt was already in his room, and Audrey was preparing to apologize to Marcy again, still dressed for work but smelled like she had just had a shower. Marcy, I am deeply sorry. I experienced car issues and was unable to pick you up. I rented a car, but Daddy had already picked you up. It's fine, Mom. I just got to the competition. Thank you, Dad. This is the second time you have missed my performances. I hope the labor is worthwhile. Marcy went into her room. Audrey turned to face me. It is not my fault that I experienced car troubles. I called your office after lunch, and they informed me that you had already left. You had more than two hours to pick up Marcy. What happened? Audrey froze and didn't breathe for three whole seconds. Then she came to her senses and stated that I was doing certain things and believed I had enough time to complete them. I had no idea my automobile would break down. I stared into Audrey's eyes for a few seconds, seeing her seem somewhat nervous as she realized what she was doing. She froze and glanced at me. What business have you been running? You've never mentioned it to me. I stared at her closely. Nothing, just a few things. Some tasks that required to be completed. I replied, Well, I hope that little thing you had to do was more important than your daughter's love. Because you're on pretty thin ice following that stunt. Then I walked up to the bedroom, the guest room, and slept alone. At least I was able to answer the question I had asked myself in passing. Audrey didn't mind missing our kids' activities. The jerk was all she was concerned about. All she cared about was not being caught. If she had truly cared, she would have canceled her appointment for that day. Instead, she used the kids' event as an excuse to leave work early and spend extra time with the rude ass. 
The next time, it will be quite painful. Audrey's automobile had no faults that the mechanics could detect. Marcy was pushing Audrey's buttons when she learned about the automobile. Mom, you said you'd take me and my buddies to the mall this Saturday. Please let me know now if you do not want to drive us. We do not want to be stranded at the mall till you have no more car troubles. Matt heard this from the next room and laughed out loud, saying, Nice joke, Marcy. The youngsters appeared to feel underappreciated by their mother. Audrey actually dared to complain to me after this, and she requested me to teach the kids how to talk to their mothers. I'll think about it, Audrey, as I await your apologies in the guest room. She didn't appreciate the irony. She simply became irritated and blamed my seclusion in the guest room on my intransigence. On Saturday, I ended up driving Marcy and her pals to the mall. Audrey mentioned that she has stuff to do. Audrey did not visit the jerk's apartment or hotel, but her automobile did spend a few hours at the property. I verified and the home was for sale. But who was with her? When did we get home? Marcy profusely thanked me in front of her mother. Marcy said she appreciated me taking the time to drive her and her pals around. Marcy contacted a buddy and ignored Audrey's questions. Audrey appeared to want to complain to me, but I laughed, took my drink, and locked myself in my office. Audrey was still wearing her work clothes, but she smelled like she had just had a shower. She had intercourse in someone's home, which she was selling. I hope she changed the bedding after this, but I doubt it. Matt's birthday was coming. We decided to rent six lanes at a bowling center and go bowling with his friends and family. It took me a while to find a bowling alley that did not have a league on Wednesday nights. What kind of happiness? When I informed Audrey about it, she gulped. It appears that Wednesdays were not her best day. I informed Audrey that I would take both children and a handful of their friends. I needed her to pick up the cake and candles from the grocery shop. We'd blow out the candles and eat pizza as Matt opened his presents. Then we'd go bowling for a few hours. The week before Matt's birthday, I had to stop the jerk's car three times to prevent them from colliding. This week, they arranged to meet for lunch on Tuesday, so I had to permanently damage his vehicle. The moron had to transport her to the workshop. They never discovered anything incorrect. He eventually got his car back that evening. I hope their pent-up frustration will make Wednesday's meeting possible. I was relieved to get Audrey's text on Wednesday morning. Looking forward to meeting you later in the afternoon. Her phone's GPS showed her heading to Jerk's flat. She had plenty of time to have fun. Grab the cake and join the party. It also allowed me ample time to pick up Audrey's gift. Have fun. Pick up the kids and head to the celebration. I went to pick up the car I had rented for this particular occasion. I needed a car with a large trunk in case Audrey opened her gift in the car. After ensuring Audrey's phone was in the jerk's apartment, I carried my purse and Audrey's gift to the front door. Carefully placed the cage, covered in black cloth, near the front door. I raised the cage door to reveal the cage. The jerk's door was now the only thing keeping the front of the cage closed. Then I took my newly bought door. Rom took three test swings before slamming it at the door with a hard punch. I took a stun gun from my pocket and momentarily activated it on the metal cage. A very agitated skunk jumped into the room. As the skunk rose to attack, I swiftly rushed inside and slammed the door shut. I soon returned to my rental automobile. After leaving, I linked to Audrey's phone's microphone. There were yells and screams. When I heard the idiot order my wife to contact the police, I blocked her phone. In her stress, she must have mistakenly entered the code several times. The sounds indicated that the jerk needed to open his bedroom door to retrieve the phone from the living room. The guy eventually got through to the cops and stated that he had a wild animal in his apartment and needed assistance. Police arrived around 15 minutes later, noticing traces of a break-in. The police entered with their rifles drawn. The skunk attacked first. Both police officers screamed and vomited before closing the apartment door. It took many hours for animal control to arrive and calmly capture the skunk. After animal control had left, police officers sat across from two stinky people, Audrey and the circus. Two more police officers arrived to assist, but when they smelled the odor in the residence, they immediately departed. Policeman, who owns this place? Asshole? I am. Who are you? Here's my driver's license. A policeman looks at Audrey. Do you reside here? Audrey, I'm only visiting. Have you have any documents? Is this actually necessary? Listen, lady, I was just attacked by a skunk. 
Do not toy with me. I am not in the mood. This is my ID. So, how do you know him? We work together. What were you doing here? We arrived to take up some documents following some radio transmission to authenticate Audrey and the jerk's identities. The officer inquired. So, what was the skunk doing inside the apartment? The idiot began to respond, but Audrey interrupted him. It was a birthday gift from me. Did you get your guy an adult skunk for his birthday? He is not my boyfriend. Stop lying, lady, boyfriend, girlfriend, and co-worker. Whatever. Why did you purchase an adult skunk as a birthday present for your boyfriend? Actually, I didn't, but I did. I purchased a skunk, but he was meant to be younger. He told me he adored skunks and had always wanted one, so I surprised him. He was not expected to be an adult. They led him to the entrance, and as he opened the sack, the beast leaped out and attacked him. The policeman, evidently not buying this gibberish and unwilling to sit and sniff the skunk, stated that the skunk must have been pricey. Just a little, but not too much. Audrey attempted to reduce it. Are you purchasing pricey pets for your co-workers without your husband's knowledge, or only for your boyfriend? Audrey didn't respond. That's right, boyfriend. What about that door, asshole? I unintentionally shattered it yesterday and did not have time to repair it. I can only envision the cops staring at them both for a whole minute of stillness before saying, Okay, I know this is all a lie, but I'm tired of this scent and I'm leaving. The sole reason you and your boyfriend left, it's because you smell worse than either me or my girlfriend. And I am not about to infect my car's seats with that odor. With these remarks, I heard them leave and the door smashed shut, broken. It made a loud noise as it closed. Asshole. What the hell was that? Audrey is always the smartest girl. We couldn't inform them that someone had broken down your door and thrown a skunk into your apartment. Why not? Because they would have asked my husband what would happen if he had done it. He already knows. If he did that, they'd have to inform him that I was here. Audrey softly asks, Be honest. How many other women are you entertaining? No one is outraged. When was the last time you slept with another lady besides me? Approximately a month ago. With resignation. Audrey, louder. Are you serious? How long? Approximately eight months. Audrey, you're even louder. You've been sleeping with her the entire time. There was another one approximately six months back, he murmured. Have their husbands found out? What makes you assume they're married? Because I know what gets you on. Now answer the question, yes, both. Were they aware it was you? Not sure. Great. Now I'm certain I made the correct decision by lying to the cops. This is most certainly payback from one of your previous conquest's husbands. I'm going to find out if my hubby is to blame. Audrey's phone calls me. Audrey, have you taken the cake yet? Damn, I am stuck at work. I am leaving immediately. Audrey, please not let Matt down either. I am leaving immediately. Do not worry. Audrey hung up from her microphone. Audrey? Damn, it's Matt's birthday. I need some cake. Then I heard Audrey shower, dress, and leave the jerk's flat. Audrey's GPS indicated that she was almost halfway to the grocery store. I halted her automobile after the fourth try to start it. I let it start. It broke down three times on the way to the store. Fortunately, it restarted each time after stopping. Audrey arrived to the store when she was already late for Matt's celebration. I heard her apologize to the candy store staff for hitting a skunk. They promptly assisted her departure. Audrey arrived at the bowling alley late in the evening bearing the cake. We all covered our noses and began coughing. After a brief conversation, Matt begged his mother to simply come home after the party. On our way home... Matt questioned me why Mom was often missing his and Marcy's events. I explained to him that she does what she believes is best for the family and that it can be difficult to be in two locations at once. Matt, you are always there for Marcy and me, and you make a lot more money. Well, I have a more flexible schedule, which makes it simpler for me to spend time with my two favorite skunks in the world. Marcy, it's not funny, Dad. It'll be amusing to tell your pals about this at school tomorrow. We had to throw away the birthday cake because it smelled so bad. Smelly birthday cake. They both thought it was quite humorous. I was grateful that I stayed in the guest room that night. A few days later, I noticed Audrey gazing inside my car and smelling the upholstery. It was funny to watch my wife. She looked like a mouse sniffing up cheese. When she returned to her house, I discreetly followed her up to the master bedroom. I observed her from around the corner using my phone's video. I captured a terrific image of her dropping down on all fours and smelling all over my shoes. 
I never asked her why the outside of her car did not smell like a skunk on Saturdays. Later, I informed everyone that I needed to go to the hardware shop. After asking everyone if they wanted to go with me and receiving negative responses, I went alone. I went straight to the jerk's flat. His car was present, which was a positive indication. I knocked on his door. He opened it and asked, How can I help? Actually, I believe we can help each other. I am Audrey's husband. Can I come inside? After his face turned pallid, I pushed by him and sat at the kitchen table. I encouraged him to sit at the table with me. I could smell both fresh paint and skunk. The furnishings and rugs looked brand new. I know you've been entertaining my wife, Audrey, for more than six months. Hey, man, I'm not sure what anyone told you, but it's all a lie. We are just pals. Would it help if I showed you some images and video footage of your typical get-togethers to stimulate your memory? I am not sure what you are talking about. Come on, there's no BS. I know you are sleeping with my wife and I have proof. I do not care about you. My wife's actions are important to me. So here is a suggestion. Instead of paying a private detective to find out if my wife had sex with you, I offered to pay you money. Do you want a video of me having sex with your wife? It will cost $2,000. The moron stared at me for a minute, allowing his feeble brain to digest what I was saying. He looked at all of the new furnishings he had just purchased for $2,000 in exchange for a video of me having sex with your wife. Are you serious? Yes, I am serious. $2,000 for a video of her face, body, and act of penetration. I'll also need your signed agreement stating you took this video and enabled me to use it. Why do you need a video when you already have enough of evidence? I need more leverage to get a divorce. Dude, that would be extremely harsh of me. Do you mean how she betrays me and her children? After a brief interval, he spoke quietly. Yes, like 2,000. I will not tell the other two husbands who just entertained their wives. To sweeten the deal, I will also pay for a spa day for two in another city. You can keep her entertained all day on Saturday at a hotel spa resort. The moron gazed at me quietly and intently. Dude, you're quite cruel. Make $3,000 and we have a deal. Great. Don't mention it to Audrey. Of course, I will book and pay for the spa and hotel in your name. It will be next Saturday, Monday evening. After that, I will contact you to schedule an appointment to receive the video. I'll pay you with cash. Are we all clear? Yes, okay. Make sure her face is clearly visible in the video. I will send you the consent form later today. I will call you the following Monday. I then left his place to continue shopping at the building supply store Wednesday evening. Audrey, honey, I neglected to inform you that I have a conference this Saturday in a few of cities nearby. Will that cause a problem? No. It appears that this will be a peaceful weekend. Have fun at your conference on Monday evening. I called the jerk to tell him. I'd pick him up from his flat. He inquired why, and I explained that I did not want to participate in any videos. I pulled him away and warned him not to say anything. I drove it down the highway to a seldom-used rest spot. I made him come out and searched him with a metal detector. After he was clean, I let him back into the car. Do you have everything I need? Yes, here it is. And he gave me the flash disk. I got my laptop from the back seat and inserted the flash disk. I spoke to the jackass. Great, this is exactly what I was searching for. Have you got a consent form? The moron pulled an envelope out of his pocket and handed it to me. I opened the envelope to ensure that the date and signature were correct. I snapped a photo of it and forwarded it to myself. I pulled an envelope from the side compartment of the door and handed it to the jerk. He counted all the dollar one hundred bills twice. I smile from ear to ear. When I handed him off at his residence, he added, If you need another video, please let me know. It was the simplest money I'd ever made. On Tuesday, I told my brother and his wife what was going on. I showed them a brief video and some photographs from other films. I also showed them a list of Audrey's dates with the jerk, highlighted in yellow, as well as the family gatherings she missed because she was with him instead. I then demonstrated the same thing to Audrey's parents. I significantly modified the photographs. I didn't want Audrey's parents to be alarmed by the image I showed them, but I did not want Audrey to get away with lying to her parents. I showed the same to my parents. I also urged everyone to avoid Audrey until I decided it was okay to begin conversing on Wednesday, while their mother was with Jerk. I sat down with the kids and explained what was happening. Mom is fascinated with another man, and I'm not sure if she still loves me. Following the shock, they inquired as to whether we will get divorced. 
I told them that we would talk about it with their mother when she got home from her boyfriend's house today. They both shouted together. Is she there now? I answered yes and demonstrated the GPS tracker in their mother's car outside her boyfriend's apartment. Marcy said the obvious. Is this why mom is always missing time with me and Matt? I showed them their mother's dated schedule of appointments with missing family occasions marked. I wanted them to understand just how unimportant they were to their mother. I then showed them a time-lapse tracker of Audrey's location on the day of Mark's missed concert and Matt's missed birthday. They began to cry when they saw what time Audrey left the office on Matt's birthday. They grieved openly when they noticed what time their mother left her lover's flat to arrive on time for Matt's birthday. Damn the skunk. I explained that the most essential thing was that I loved them, that there was an issue between their mother and me. We were determined to do everything we could to keep our family together. After half an hour of crying, hugging, and talking, we heard the front door open, and Audrey entered the home, taking in everyone's reactions. She seemed anxious and inquired as to what had transpired. Children, why don't you go to your rooms while Mom and I are talking? They both jumped up and hugged me warmly before giving their mother an angry glare and heading to their rooms. As soon as I heard the doors close, I requested Audrey to sit. What's going on, Audrey? I understand you are having an affair. No, God, it is not true. I'd never cheat on you. Why would you say that? Audrey's eyes began to fill with tears. Audrey, if you won't tell me the truth, this talk is finished. This must be some sort of error. Someone felt they saw something that was not true. Okay, Audrey, we're finished for today. Please spend the rest of the day reflecting about what you are doing to this family. We'll talk about this again tomorrow. In the meantime, don't talk to me or the kids until we've resolved this. We will have to hash this out between ourselves. Then I rose from the table and went to my room. The guest room. Audrey followed me the entire way and told me I was mistaken. When I shut the door in her face, she went silent. Then I heard her attempt to speak gently through Marcy's door. Marcy, what did Dad tell you? This is all a mistake. Please open the door so that we may talk. Marcy said nothing but wrote to both me and Matt. Can you make her leave? I will try, but she just told me I was mistaken about her affair, so there is no purpose in having an open discussion if she is going to lie. Maybe you're making a mistake. I have photos of them naked in bed together. I opened the door and Audrey glanced at me. Please leave the children alone until we have resolved this between us. You're making things harder for them than they need to be. But I'd like to know what you told them. I told them the truth. You have another man. This is between us till we can work it out. Now please leave the children alone. Audrey sadly went to her bedroom. I heard her crying all night. The next day, Thursday, I sat at the kitchen table waiting for Audrey to come home. The children were with friends. They did not want to be around it. Audrey, please sit down. Audrey sat down. Have you thought about what you do with your family? She nodded. Yes, are you willing to communicate openly with me about your affair? She nodded again. So, what are you telling me? This is all a misunderstanding. Yes, I had a connection, but it was solely an emotional one. I've had lunch with him several times, despite the fact that you requested me not to join him for lunch. But we worked together, and this is unavoidable. I told him some of my feelings, but that was all. Believe me, dear, I just love you. If you believe that lying is the best way to get out of this position, the talk ends. I'll chat to you on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. My children will spend the night with my parents today and tomorrow. We'll talk again on Saturday a.m. Once again, please consider what you are doing to this family. I got up and went into my room. Audrey did not say anything or follow me. I got up early Saturday morning to eat breakfast with the kids at Audrey's parents' place. When I got home... I parked in front of my house. When I walked in, Audrey was sitting at the kitchen table. I asked, Are you ready to talk honestly with me about the affair? Audrey nodded. Have you told my parents about this? Yes. Have you informed your parents, brother, and his wife about this? Yes. How could you do this to me? Because I'm always proud of all your efforts. Look at how much effort you put into your connection, all the falsehoods to myself, the kids, and our parents. You told lies. Looking directly into your eyes, I just had to lift the thin veil of trust that you're hiding behind. But this is not true at all. I kissed him several times, that is all. 
and now you have turned our parents and children against me. This talk has ended because you continue to refuse to be honest with me. The youngsters will live with their grandparents indefinitely. I will stay in the guest room and work from our home office as normal. We will talk about it on Tuesday once you return from work. Once again, please consider what you are doing to this family. I got up, left the home, and drove away. That night, I came home from supper with my parents and children. Audrey sat in the living room. Audrey, we can talk on Tuesday. I said, then went to bed. Audrey's pals sent me countless text messages urging me to forgive her. It was only an innocent error. I initiated a video call with them. I told them Audrey had been having sex with another man for several months. Then I presented the evidence. They both promptly apologized before hanging up. I never heard anything else from them. Audrey, I don't believe you. Audrey came home on Tuesday evening and I left my home office to meet her at the kitchen table. She brought home pasta from our favorite Italian restaurant and set a plate for me at the table. Audrey was weary with bags under her eyes. The days of wondering what falsehoods to tell your friends and family so they don't discover what a terrible person you are take a toll on the victim's voice. Nobody speaks to me. Lies have repercussions. They think I am a monster. In fact, Audrey, you demonstrated to everyone that you have a monster inside. They claimed you showed them a photograph and video of me and my partner. Yes, I showed you. Nobody will show me this photograph. Can I see her? My acquaintance stated that you presented it to her via FaceTime. I enjoy it when a plan comes true. Yes, just so you know, it may assist with this talk. I didn't let any additional copies go out. I do not intend for our family to be mocked because of your behavior. I showed her the photographs and videos. I really love you. Can't we forget this mistake? How intense was your love for me? Did you have to be with someone else? I've never loved him. Marriage is rather simple. Shared duties, trust, and pleasure. I was completely responsible, trustworthy, and enjoyed myself with you. However, you left behind the majority of financial and familial duties. You placed all of your trust in me as you partied around town. I stared at her for a minute. You took my love by giving it to someone else. How long have you known? Seven months. She spoke quietly. Seven months? Why have you waited so long? At first I hoped it was a one-time error, and you'd be open with me and accept your error because you always claim you love me. I apologize. How can I believe anything you say now? I love you, and I'm telling you the truth. Is this the truth you told me during our previous three meetings when you denied having an affair? After a few minutes of stillness, I looked at Audrey, who was looking at her food. Audrey, what can I do to improve things? I got the envelope from my home office and put it on the desk in front of Audrey. This is an agreement made after marriage. Sign that, and I will consider accepting you back. Obviously, you, I, and the kids will need to go to therapy to make this work. I do not want to sign a prenuptial agreement. Okay, then we are done. My understanding is that you simply want to reconcile so that you can emerge from this marriage financially stronger. What do I gain if I sign the agreement? If one of us decides to get divorced, I will receive 70% of everything— if I am detected cheating, the ratio will reset to 5,050. If you cheat, I'll receive 85%. In both circumstances, I am granted full custody of the children. Have a lawyer. Look it over and sign it. I will only contemplate staying in this marriage if I am convinced that you are willing to make some financial sacrifices. How much time do I have to make a decision? Until Saturday morning, as I stood up to depart, Audrey asked, Aren't you going to eat? After everything you've done and lied to me, I ordered your favorite cuisine. Should I anticipate the arsenic sauce to be especially fresh? She began crying a lot. I signed the marriage contract later to reclaim my trust. At least a bit. The next day, I went to Audrey's workplace when she was gone. I held a meeting with the office manager. It was an elderly woman who had worked there for many years. Her husband was the owner, but he no longer came into the office. Audrey appeared to be spreading lies in front of the entire staff. How can I help you today? She definitely gave me a furious expression. I believe there is a misunderstanding that I am the evil guy when it comes to my wife. Anyway, it appears to be a personal concern, unrelated to this office. Now, if that is all. I have a hectic schedule, so please leave the premises. If you refuse, I will have to contact the police. 
it's truly about this office since it's about my wife's relationship with a certain employee with whom she has sex. She didn't like it when I cursed in front of her. Do you have any evidence to back up these accusations? Of course. Here's a photo of my wife and her co-worker. I also have dozens of voice recordings in which they admit that they were supposed to show clients objects but ended up having sex instead. I showed short clips from the two most incriminating recordings. She was quite unhappy. Can I anticipate my wife will be fired immediately? Yes, together with her sweetheart. Unfortunately, you can't fire her lover. I was allowed to record my wife's chats, but not his. None of this can be proven in court. Hence, it was a lie. I don't want to be accused of libel. And I doubt you want either. Thanks for the information. She felt relieved and almost smiled. I leave a photograph. No, I do not want this photo to be circulated out of curiosity, to the damage of my family. Audrey arrived home that evening in tears. She lost her work and did not receive any recommendations. She wanted to talk, but I didn't respond until Saturday morning when I went to my room and locked the door. Audrey was seated at the kitchen table. Should you have fired me when you discovered I knew about your affair? You should have quit immediately in order to prevent touch with your boyfriend. I simply made the correct decision for you. Your moral compass is obviously damaged. This is the first topic we discuss. Sorry. I thought we had already agreed that we would never longer debate decisions that could have a detrimental influence on our marriage or children. By the way, have you signed any post-nuptial agreements? Yes, giving me the envelope. I reviewed it and saw that it was signed and dated. I forwarded an electronic copy to my lawyer and kept the physical copy in a safe. Then I announced the new household rules. Good behavior on her side and we'll all begin receiving counseling. I'll also inform everyone in the family that we're working on improving our marriage. I knew it would not last. I haven't even scheduled a consultation for the next 30 days. My wife was the ideal housewife, loving and caring. She was even thoughtful enough to put a small camera in my workplace so she could see what I was typing and what was on my screen. I discovered her setting up a covert camera in my office, which I only watched from my laptop in my car while away from home. When I arrived down to the kitchen on Saturday morning, Audrey was seated at the table drinking coffee and looking like the cat that ate the canary. We exchanged pleasantries. I took the coffee and sat opposite her. Where are the children? I delivered them to my parents. Why? We haven't had sex in a month and I was expecting to change your mind this morning. It's actually been eight months. Eight months? What? What do you mean by eight months? That's how long it has been since we had sex. It cannot be that long. You are wrong. I understand how difficult it may be for you to keep track of this given how much you have cheated. But believe me, I am the one who hasn't received it in eight months. I am not mistaken, Audrey. Well, we could modify that. Audrey smiled and began to get up, but I motioned for her to remain seated. Audrey, I still remember what you did and said, and I haven't been able to get those images out of my thoughts. It will not happen. Okay, so be stubborn. I tried to be pleasant. I performed all you requested, and you and the kids continue to treat me like a pariah. I want you to start showing me more respect, starting now. Is this the way you want to handle it, Audrey? Yes, I do not enjoy being blackmailed for this job with your disgusting movies, and I have already taken steps to address it. I removed all of your copies. You were incorrect when you stated that you have control over your copies. I even removed your copies from cloud storage and destroyed your small flash drive. I was watching you. You are so predictable. I'm tired of being an outcast in my own home, and I'll stay with my sister until you come to your senses and start treating me more respectfully. You no longer have photos to keep me in line. I obtained another employment and want to take care of myself. I'll pick up the kids from school every day and will eat dinner at my new apartment without you until you start treating me right. Audrey stood up and approached the front door. To her amazement, her sister emerged from the dining room and they both left the house for two months. Audrey focused on her parents and children. She said, I never kept any records. She claimed that the severely modified photo was the result of me photoshopping Audrey and her lover's heads into the image. She informed the children and her parents that if I truly had proof, I should provide it. Of course, Audrey removed everything. The children weren't sure who to believe. Audrey's parents wanted to believe her. I even noticed some skepticism in my parents' eyes. They didn't distrust me. Rather, they were concerned that I might lose the children's trust. My brother and his wife supported me wholeheartedly. Now I felt like an exile. 
I met with her lover to set up another video session. This time, I did my best. I booked a hotel room on the beach in Florida. I purchased two first-class tickets for Audrey and the idiot, and he offered him $5,000 for the film. I also advised him it should be recorded on the hotel room's balcony. The moron requested me to pay for a fancy restaurant to feed and pamper her. I realized he was trying to extort more money from me. I eavesdropped on supper. They invited Karen. Audrey and Karen were quite excited. I had to purchase another first-class ticket for Karen. Two weeks later, I was riding in the car with the jerk, watching the most recent video on my laptop. Everything was precisely how I requested. Audrey remained completely obstructed for the next two hours. When I finished watching the video, I remarked, Jerk. Great job. I encrypted the video before uploading it to the cloud. I also encrypted the copies on the flash drive before placing it in my pocket. I closed my laptop and placed it in my briefcase in the back seat. Then I drove out of the roadside parking lot. The moron demanded his money, but I told him I had some questions. Did you approach my wife first? Not really. It just sort of occurred, you know, working together and all. Who was the first to discuss sex? Yes, she is. By this point, I had turned on to the two-lane road and we were on our way back into town. I'm curious how many women you've seduced in town. I've just been in town for a few years, but I've already been with seven women. Really? Who are they? I can't tell you. It would be unfair. I will give you another thousand. Make two and we'll make a deal. If you could tell me where. And about when we'll have an agreement. He listed all seven. Office manager. Two additional women from the office and four women from a couple of gyms where he exercised. Everybody was married. I switched off the recorder in my pocket. I told him, wow, this is crazy. Would you like to witness something even crazier? I pushed the gas pedal hard. The automobile immediately sped to 70 miles per hour. The idiot said, What are you doing, man? I do not need to see anything outrageous. I responded, Sorry, that wasn't the craziest part. Here it is. I steered the car into the trees alongside the road and braked hard. We got lucky and hit a tree at less than 40 miles per hour. Both of our seatbelts were fastened and the airbags rescued us. However, it still causes significant pain. I came to my senses first. The passenger next to me exhibited no indications of life. I contacted the police to report the collision. Police later determined that incident was an accident. As expected, they confiscated my laptop and flash drive for proof. After being evaluated in the hospital, I returned home. I had been unwell for a week. Audrey discovered out about my accident when she learned of Jerk's death. The following week, she realized what had happened. She called me to find out about his death. I claimed I knew nothing. Not surprisingly, the next day, the police arrived and questioned me about the deceased's link to my wife. I admitted that I knew about it, which was why we were in the car together. I paid him money so he wouldn't see my wife again, but the jackass breached his word and demanded more money. That's when the accident occurred. The police were messing with me, putting pressure on me. So I finally asked, are you suggesting that I deliberately drove the car into a tree in the hope that he would be the only one to die? They then left practically immediately. Yes, I had the opportunity and the motivation, but I'd known about their relationship for a long time, and my fingerprints were not on the pencil. And who puts their life at risk by ramming their automobile into a tree at high speed in order to murder someone else? How would you prove it in court? Audrey contacted a few days later and asked to meet with me to discuss our marriage. But following the death of the jerk, she decided to do it on neutral ground. She also asked her sister to accompany her since she felt unsafe, being alone with me right now. I inquired what she meant. She said that the house was out of the question. She did not want the talk to be taped. She suggested we meet at a random hotel. She would make a choice. I told her that was fine, but I would select the number. She argued that she was in danger and had to choose between the two. But I also informed her that I did not want this conversation to be recorded on her end. This manner, no party will know the exact number until everyone is logged in. I started to question what Audrey's true purpose was. She may simply meet me at home like before. She absolutely did not want me to write down what was going to happen. We met on the next Saturday afternoon. I followed Audrey and Karen in Audrey's car to a luxury hotel across town. When we arrived and checked in, the hotel receptionist suggested room 216. 
I informed the receptionist that I preferred a higher floor room with a view of the hotel's front. I made the receptionist provide multiple numbers before selecting one. Audrey and Karen were obviously dissatisfied. They'll likely have to pay again to get their recorders out of room 216. They'll have to forget about the bribe they gave the cashier in the elevator. Karen stood next to me, wrapped her arm around my waist, squeezed her breasts against my side, and whispered, Regardless of how this ends, I hope we can remain friends. I informed her that this was a debate between me and my wife, and that I would prefer that she not intervene. Karen was probably the only person or lady she publicly flirted with over the years, but did not sleep with. Audrey didn't trust her sister around me and explicitly warned Karen to keep away from me. Clearly, something has changed. I did not complain. The hotel room was standard. There was an office desk and chair in one corner, a chest of drawers along the long wall, and a queen-size bed in the other. Audrey asked, What now? I smiled and added, Take off your clothes completely naked. I do not trust you. You don't trust me. Audrey gazed at Karen. That is my sister. I do not want you to see her naked. Come on. She doesn't have anything that most people in town haven't seen before. Karen stuck out her tongue at me. She had a piercing through the center of her tongue. Okay. Audrey gave in and got completely naked. Worked. I now know another of her ambitions. Fortunately, I arrived prepared. Audrey and Karen started to undress. I hurriedly took off my clothes and neatly placed them on the work table, my back to Audrey and Karen, between them and my clothing. I took a pen from my jeans pocket and set it behind my clothes on the table. It matched the other hotel pen that was on the table. Exactly. Audrey suggested the hotel plan and she included the hotel's name. I spent the next day going to every hotel and motel to collect a free pen from the front desk. When we arrived at the hotel, I picked out a pen from my collection and placed the camera inside. I hollowed out each handle slightly to accommodate the camera. They didn't appear any different, but the camera grip was far heavier than a cheap plastic grip should have been. I took my clothing, went to the restroom, and placed them there. I didn't lose sight of the two women undressing or the hand holding a towel. I then returned naked to the table and sat down in a chair. Audrey and Karen were sitting on the bed, their clothing lying next to them. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's get started with the tiny stuff. I tried not to gaze at Karen's attractiveness. Audrey, do not be like that. I was wanting to have a meaningful chat. In a few minutes, we'll know who properly predicted what this talk will be about. Audrey spoke in her softest voice. I love you, sweetie. Yes, like your favorite pair of shoes. You understand that is not true. I genuinely love you. Yes, so long as your credit card works. Audrey's voice increased in pitch. Don't be so down. Our marriage is strong enough to withstand this. Strong? You utilized all of our strength to repeatedly stab my back with a knife. And you want me to hand you back the knife and turn my back on you again? Don't be too theatrical. This was a mistake. Yes, a mistake that will result in a divorce. Darling, don't be like that. It was merely a minor error. It was not a minor error. It was evil. Evil plan. Put the puppies in a bag with a rock and throw them into the river, drowning them with my finest falsetto. I apologize. I didn't realize it would kill them when I threw it in the river. Honey, I apologize for lying to you. But it was simply because I felt ashamed of what I had done. I stopped lying after you faced me with the facts, and I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. You mean when I first informed you I knew? And you stated that there must be an error. Someone noticed something that was not true. Lies. Or the second time you claimed it was all a misunderstanding? Yes, I felt a connection, but it was solely an emotional one. Or the third time you claimed I had only kissed him a few times. The time you informed your two friends and they called to persuade me to accept you back because it was a one-time error. I believe you decided to be honest after I showed you the photo. I believe you chose to quit lying about your affair when you realized it wasn't working anymore. But it won't stop you from lying about other things, right? Karen, observing her sister's restrained reaction to my words, continued, We don't want anyone to overreact and say something they'll regret later. Looking at Karen with amazement, I remarked, you are going too far. Are you kidding me? I believe you are underestimating the situation. 
I am always shocked at how much cheaters try to downplay the infidelity of others. Karen, how many boyfriends and husbands have you deceived? How many married men have you seduced? Audrey, in a soft voice, but I am deeply sorry for what I did to you. You feel guilty, so everything should be forgiven. Unfortunately, I believe you do not feel guilty enough. My job is to assist you with this shortcoming. Audrey spoke with the voice of a forlorn kid. It's not that horrible. Tell me, sweetheart, what makes you the person you are now, a common? Do you understand what a con artist is? Someone who gains someone's trust and then deceives them? I returned to my natural voice. Audrey responded, I did not fool you. Marriage is a contract that requires fidelity and trust. You cheated on me and told me lies. How is this not cheating? I upheld my end of the bargain with a little more force in her voice. She claimed it was merely sex. That is why you have hidden it from me all this time. It was only sex, and you knew I could be upset about it. Like the time you neglected to get me orange juice at the grocery. Louder. She accused me and forced me to sign this post. The nuptial arrangement was unfair. Unfair? If I receive a traffic ticket, I will pay the fine. If I do not pay my taxes, they take my money. If I drink too much and loiter on the street, they take me to jail for the night. Cheaters cheat. So what? Nothing. If life were fair, marriage licenses would be contracts that required cheats to immediately forfeit 75% of their assets in the event of a divorce. And unmarried cheats, like the jerk, would face maximum punishments given that they are only social parasites that feed on the enjoyment of others. I spoke loudly. Marriage entails raising a family and remaining true to one person. Otherwise, what is the point of marrying? Audrey glanced at me, unable to respond. Audrey, do you know how many marriages that began with adultery survived? More than a few of years? Five percent. This is also the percentage of open marriages. Was it your intention, Audrey, to divorce me, marry your boyfriend, and live in an open marriage? We will probably never know, right? He's died. Audrey's face was deformed, and her eyes had an awful glitter. Okay, screw you. I've erased all of your evidence, so you no longer have anything to keep me in line. We both suffered, and my parents and children aren't sure who to believe. Was it worthwhile? Was it worth ruining your marriage? Loudly pointing a finger. Either at himself, or at Audrey. I did not damage this marriage. You ruined this marriage. I'm simply giving the time of death. Audrey was clearly taken aback by my response. She still believed that the troubles in our marriage were my fault for catching her and being unreasonable. Audrey was quite angry. Perhaps I wouldn't have slept with someone else if you had paid more attention to me. Why should I? You paid no attention to me. Audrey appeared to lose her breath after hearing this answer. We sat in silence for a minute, just looking at each other. We both seemed to relax a little. Did you kill him? With my hand on the camera and the pen, I grinned broadly and responded. It was an accident. How could you do that? Audrey tried to get me to offer an emotional apologies for the jerk's death. Alternatively, I may provide moral explanation for my behavior, but I did not. Any one of these could be interpreted as an admission of guilt. That's why I remained mute. Audrey's eyes started to fill with tears. He was a good guy, allowing my rage to creep into my speech. I asked, Do you mean the nice guys who seduce other people's wives? Audrey's in tears. But you still adore me. Do I understand the connection? I loved you. Most people, including those who are married, never have the opportunity to experience true love. You had that from me for a brief period in your life. All I received in return was your wedding wish— your yearning for a husband, money, and fidelity. You abandon love for something as disgusting as passion, because you never knew what true love was. Millions of men will want you for the sake of passion, but someone will. I honestly love you as much as I did after everything you did to your family and myself. Audrey had tears flowing down her cheeks. This obviously proceeded as Audrey had planned, although I have to acknowledge that Audrey swiftly recovered and returned to her goal. Her eyes altered and her mind spun. The primary plans failed. It's time to go to the next attack. Audrey stood up, dried her eyes, and looked me straight in the eye, saying, I want a drink. Does anyone else need a drink? I'm going to go down to the bar and get a drink. Then I'll return and hopefully we can discuss it like adults. 
Audrey then stood up, went to the bathroom, dressed, and exited the room. As soon as the room door banged shut, Audrey. Karen commented, you look delicious. Karen, this is definitely not the time. Karen rose off the bed and stood between my legs. Karen, I appreciate the offer, but your sister will be back shortly. What she doesn't know will not harm her. Now, I simply needed to get Karen to quit. I was battling with myself in my head when Karen abruptly hugged me and pushed me onto the bed. She yelled loudly, Please stop! The door! Audrey raced into the room, holding the phone in front of her. What are you doing with my sister? Karen, he attacked me! Make him! Audrey pushed me. She gave me a wide smile and dropped the phone on the carpet. When she picked it up, I watched her push the video's end button. She then clicked a few more times, presumably to send the video to the cloud. Audrey, you're in trouble. I shot a video of you. Thank God I decided to return to the room. I arrived just in time to save her. They both chuckled, and I sank back in my chair, despondent. She waved her finger in my face and said, This is how the divorce will work. First and foremost, there is no more post-nuptial agreement. If you mention a nuptial agreement, I will put you in jail. I do not want to do it. You're only given this opportunity for the benefit of the children. Second, I want 90% of everything. In addition, you are responsible for all legal fees. I am granted full custody of the children, 50% of the child support, and I want to receive 20% of the child support for the rest of my life. What am I saying? Me with my sister. And this footage will land you in court and send you to jail for assault. Got it? Yes. I underestimated Audrey. This final plan was clearly her primary goal. A extremely brilliant girl. Karen immediately dressed. Come on, Audrey. Audrey was crying ten minutes ago about the love I'd lost. Now she was exiting the room with her sister, both laughing at me. I watched from the window of the room until they left. Then I got dressed, grabbed my pen, and left the motel. The meeting went far better than I had imagined. Audrey received her divorce papers the next day. The post-nuptial agreement had to be completely respected. When Audrey called me with her recording, I told her that you did not delete everything. And I did not show you everything. You blame me. I'll be free the next day, but you'll end up in jail. Audrey, as I already mentioned, is a bright young lady. At the time, there were too many unknowns to use her hotel meeting video. I knew she would wait and observe before revealing her trump card. We both hired lawyers. I did not make any concessions. I wanted everything stated in the post-nuptial agreement to be implemented. Prior to the post-nuptial agreement, I supplied transcripts of all of my records to my attorney. My lawyer informed Audrey's lawyer that, owing to unforeseen circumstances, we are restoring the records Audrey destroyed, and we currently only have transcripts. We talked a lot about lawyer negotiating. I didn't care. I intended for Audrey to pay for everything. Audrey also retained an expensive lawyer. Apparently, she assumed I would pay for everything. The lawyers eventually gave up and called it a day in court. The questions were, is a post-nuptial agreement appropriate? Do I actually have any records? Several days before the trial, I had a special courier send registered letters to Audrey and Karen at Karen's residence. The letter was a counterfeit, although an outstanding one. It came from the Centers for Disease Control, which informed Audrey and Karen that just before his death, her then-partner had been into contact with someone who had AIDS, and test results indicated that he had gotten the disease. They informed my wife that she should see a doctor right away and that the Centers for Disease Control will contact her to collect a list of all of her sexual partners over the previous year. It also said unequivocally that she should refrain from having intercourse for the following 12 months until the disease was confirmed to have not been contracted on the day of trial. The judge was not happy with any of us. Audrey claimed her innocence and that she had not broken the prenuptial agreement. In reality, she claimed that the marriage contract was signed under coercion. She had never committed adultery, but she was so frightened of losing her children and husband that she signed the agreement without first reading it or obtaining assistance. She was concerned about the transcripts, believing they might be admissible in court. In other terms, I fooled her. She cried convincingly as her lawyer spoke. I, on the other hand, claimed that the post-nuptial agreement was drafted because she was an adulterer. She simply signed it under duress from the divorce. She broke the marriage commitment. She was an unfit mother, and the post-nuptial agreement was reasonable. 
Judge, do you have any evidence that she committed adultery? My lawyer created video and voice recordings to supplement the transcripts we had already generated. Judge, why are you making films and audio recordings now? We were able to collect video and voice records only after a lengthy effort. We have the original transcripts, but Audrey removed them. As you are aware, recovering data through a certified technique takes a long time. We just obtained the evidence at the courthouse. Did Audrey erase the posts? Yes, Your Honor. We also have a recording of her admitting to this. I persuaded Audrey to erase my posts. I purposefully assured Audrey that I had complete control over the video. After she set up her small camera in my office, I updated the recording and saved it in multiple locations, including a flash drive on my desk. Audrey assumed she now knew where. I kept all of my copies after Audrey deleted them. I did my best to make Audrey believe she had deleted everything and I was helpless. It was now bearing fruit. Judges dislike persons who purposefully erase evidence. Audrey also lied to the judge, saying she had never cheated and that I lacked evidence. Audrey is not off to a good start. I understand. The judge questioned my wife's lawyer. Do the transcripts and records match? Yes. Your... You wish to contest the recording's authenticity? Audrey's lawyer examined Audrey, who shook her head slightly. No, Your Honor. This so answers the question of the legality of existence after marriage and eliminates any justification for force to sign a contract. However, I believe all of these notes were made before the contract was signed. None of this is evidence of adultery after marriage. Yes, Your Honor. The transcript of the final film, as well as the video itself, demonstrate Audrey's infidelity after signing the prenuptial agreement. Why is this also happening now? Until recently, this evidence was in police custody and had not yet been returned to my client. It was part of an accident-related death inquiry. We weren't convinced the video still existed. The court questioned Audrey's counsel. Have you had a chance to watch the video? Yes, Your Honor. However, we consider the film is unsuitable because there is no consent form, and if the video is permitted, there is no evidence that it was not shot before the prenuptial agreement was executed. My lawyer... First, the video was captured on a public balcony with no expectation of privacy, so a consent form is not necessary. Second, we can establish the time and date of the event. Judge, how is that? It's simple. My client paid for Audrey, Karen, and her lover's plane tickets, as well as the hotel room where they had their secret meeting. This earned me some glances. Judge, did you agree to your wife's affair? She never asked for my approval, and I never consented or condoned her criminal conduct. So... How did you pay for their plane tickets and hotel rooms before the video? I ran into her lover and asked him how much money he would need to cease dating the mother of my kids. I also mentioned that he might lose his job. He told me $2,000 tickets to Jamaica, including a three-night stay at a five-star hotel. We agreed, and I purchased ticket coupons. And he maintained his word by using the air show and hotel vouchers in Florida. The next week, after my wife had left town for a conference over the weekend, Judge, how do we know this is the proper hotel? In the first photograph, you can see the hotel sign in the backdrop. How did you receive the video? I paid for it as soon as I learned about my wife's indiscretions. I asked him for proof. He was kind enough to give me visual evidence. Why did you gather this evidence? Divorce. Did your girlfriend understand why you were collecting this information? Yes. Several months ago, I told him that I thought it would be quicker and cheaper to have my testimony directly from him rather than a private individual, even though I had to pay him to quit committing adultery with my wife. He called and offered to sell me another DVD, which I paid $1.500 for. Audrey broke the post nuptial. If you need someone to testify about the validity and date of the video, my wife's sister is sitting right there. I pointed to Karen. Everyone in the courtroom turned to face Karen. Wow, I discovered something Karen didn't seem to enjoy. The court chastised me for using filthy language and I apologized. The judge then inquired, Is that all you received from your wife's lover that night? Looking directly into Audrey's eyes, This is what happened that night. However, he gave me with the majority of the records you have today. He's been doing this for several months, including accommodation and flights. I paid him approximately $3,000. Audrey looked like her head was about to explode. My testimony about her partner made her look like an absolute moron. 
My testimony led her to believe that practically the whole time she was having fun with him, he was recording their sex and talks in order to profit from her divorce by selling them to her husband for a mere $3,000. Audrey would give him ten times more not to make the tape, no matter how upset she was. Audrey's mind was turning, and I could tell. That must be all of the videos he has. I was too scared of him to take notes on our recent encounter at the hotel. If he had anything else, he would have shown it already. When I finished speaking, I noticed Audrey making a quick decision. Audrey will whisper into her lawyer's ear. Her lawyer requested a short respite. As we approached lunchtime, the judge permitted it. When we returned, Audrey's lawyer informed us that he had just received a video of me committing a horrific crime, which reflected on my character. It would also establish that I had committed adultery, which was punishable in the post-natal period. Audrey and Karen agreed to vouch to the video's veracity. The judge asked Karen to verbally affirm the validity of the footage. Audrey then explained, Until now, my sister and I did not want to throw my children's father in jail. But now that I know how manipulative he is, I must do the right thing. They showed the footage to Audrey. He began flashing the hotel door when someone screamed, Please stop! Audrey suddenly stormed into the room, revealing me on top of Karen. Audrey yelled, What are you doing to my sister? Karen yelled. He attacked me. Make him stop. Audrey then grabs her sister. Her phone falls to the carpet and the video finishes. What happened then? Asked the judge. I locked myself in the bathroom and informed my husband that if he did not leave the room in two minutes, I would call the police. I also informed him that I had already uploaded the film to the cloud so he could not erase it, and he departed. Yes. Now I had major issues. I looked back and noticed Audrey's father and mother looking at me suspiciously. Fortunately, my parents were at home with their children. I felt bad for Audrey's parents. The judge stares at me. So what can you say in your defense? My lawyer. We have a video that refutes that. Let's see. Audrey's attorney leaped out of his seat and attempted to discredit the footage before it was shown. Judge, let me clarify. You may provide your surprise film of the hotel meeting, but we are not permitted to view their surprise reply video from the same hotel. Is this what you're saying? The judge even grinned. Audrey's lawyer sat silently. Audrey had already become noticeably pale. I could hear her thoughts as if they were scrawled across her forehead. Crap. This must be a recording from the restroom. I even placed one of my recorders beneath the bathroom door, but all I could hear were a few murmured words through the stupid towel he had placed there. The video began with us considering stripping due to recording. Audrey and Karen walked out the door, laughing briefly at the end of the film. When I remarked in the video that our court system does not support marriage, the judge looked at me with sadness. The expression in his eyes informed me that he, too, was a victim of his wife's adultery. Was he acknowledging the awful status of our judicial system in terms of marriage vows, or maybe both? As the video played, Audrey accused me of murdering her beloved. Audrey became angry and started whispering something into her lawyer's ear. Finally, her attorney glanced at her and shook his head no. Prior to presenting the footage, my lawyer confirmed that none of my words on the film incriminated me. Audrey's lawyer was assuring her that nothing I said constituted an admission of guilt. Audrey must have been mortified by this response. I know her first intention was to be kind and get me to forgive her. Her second purpose in the meeting was to deceive me into testifying about Douche's death and Audrey's master plan. Audrey was now suffering the consequences of her phony attack on Karen. It was unfortunate that Audrey seemed to believe she could outwit me. She seemed to believe that her novel demonstrated that she was smarter than me, but she did not outsmart me. I trusted her. She camouflaged her affair behind the faith I had in her. Now that trust has vanished. Karen attempted to flee when the video captured her unexpectedly throwing her arms around me and pulled me into the bed. The bailiff seized her and sat her down. I was mistaken. Audrey felt terribly humiliated. I understand. She overheard her parents signing behind. Her relatives exited the courtroom before the video ended. They'd heard and seen enough. Audrey knew she'd never get any help from her parents again. After the video was done, the judge ordered that the marriage arrangement would take effect as planned. My lawyer then informed the judge that we had lately discovered Audrey had a secret bank account, which she had not mentioned during the discovery process. 
The account held more than all other assets combined. Audrey informed me that she receives a paycheck every four weeks. Instead, she received a paycheck every two weeks and transferred all other wages and the majority of her bonuses into a secret account for years. She also recently took out all of the equity in our home using a second mortgage and deposited it in a concealed account. But I urged my lawyer not to inform the judge or Audrey about this. My lawyer has just handed over my bank account balance to the judge. The most recent transfer appeared to be Audrey transferring our mortgage funds to her secret account and then running away. This selfish error is officially the reason the bank and lawyers found Audrey's secret account. The second mortgage transfer was actually my responsibility. Audrey logs in from her phone and does everything online. I noticed Audrey's account on the first day I installed the monitoring software. Hidden monies that were not disclosed throughout the divorce discovery process are subject to a specific law. The court used his legal authority to give me full ownership of the item. She was also compelled to pay 100% of all legal expenses and court costs. Fortunately for me, Audrey was greedy and transferred all of the valuables in the house to her secret account. According to the judge's decision, I will no longer be required to pay her half of the house share. The judge then sentenced Audrey and Karen to 90 days in jail. Perjury. As a result, I obtained 95% of the property, full custody of the children, a house, two of the best automobiles out of three, and alimony for several years. I still have my life, a rewarding work, and most importantly, my children. Trust me. The 5% she received was insufficient to cover half of the attorney and court fees she paid for her clothes, car, and jewels. Unfortunately for her, I sold all of her expensive jewelry within a month of learning about her affair. I sold them when we were still blissfully married. They were in the safe, so I stopped bringing Audrey with me anywhere. She had no cause to wear them, so she didn't realize anything was missing. She could also not verify that I had sold them. I objected. She'd sold the jewels and was attempting to blame me. I bought my dream car using money from my jewelry and accident insurance. I had been saving money for jewelry for months, planning to combine it with the car accident settlement. If I hadn't received compensation, it would have meant that I was driving too fast when I hit the tree, and the money would have gone towards my burial expenses. Audrey did her best to remain close to the children, considering her repute. Good jobs were limited, so she had to travel roughly an hour across many towns. They never forgave their mother, and were humiliated to be with her. Audrey and Karen were only able to obtain jobs as bar waiters. I also sent a lover's final remarks to six spouses and seven wives. My ex-wife occasionally leaves drunken messages on my phone. On rare occasions, Audrey's voicemails and videos include her wishing I were dead, accusing me of ruining her life, or threatening to exact revenge on me someday. However, Audrey frequently accompanies the messages and videos with tears, telling me that I am the love of her life, begging for my forgiveness, and hoping that we might be together again someday. I keep every video and message in case Audrey decides to try to reintegrate into our children's lives. I acknowledge that my wife never loved me in the same manner that I loved her. She has never and will never understand what true love is. For her, life is evaluated by how much you take rather than how much you give. You didn't expect my ex-wife to be at the end. Did you know her fate? I have a restraining order against her and her crazed sister. I believe they still have anger towards me. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe, if you haven't already. Also, write a comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. Take care.